lectured quite a long, um, all over the United... Sorry, I can't see my notes so well. <laughs> um, she has lectured all over the United States, including the Smithsonian Institute. She has also lectured at Cambridge University. And the lectures in the, over the following three days, she developed for the Edinburgh Festival, particularly the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. She's actually born, South African born, and she trained as an artist at Michaelis. Um, so, and she, if you would like to see some of her work, she's got her own website at hilaryguides.com. Thank you. Thank you very much. Want to be the lights? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, go down. Oh dear, just a minute. I'm just trying to get this right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Blue. Blue. Well, um, blue is apparently, I, I can't see my notes, but that's fine. <laughs> We've been trying to turn the light on without a great deal of success. Um, could you just turn that off? You were listening to John Hall's trumpet playing the theme music from Brideshead, in case you're wondering what that music was. Well, blue is apparently the world's most popular color. If you were to take a poll, you would find that blue came out top. And it's probably a color we see a lot of, certainly down here, where we have the most impenetrable blue skies over our heads. But that's all due to physics. It wasn't some sort of random good idea on the part of the creator. It is all due to physics. Um, the truth is, color doesn't exist. My jacket isn't pink, the sky isn't blue. Um, none of the color in this room really exists. The color is not in the thing you see. Everything is gray. It is entirely light that makes the color. In the light waves, they come at different frequencies. And when the frequencies can't go through the matter, you see the color, right? Do you understand that? It's complicated. I'm sure you all know that from school. So um, the reason the sky is blue has a physical reason. It is a fact that the atmosphere is full of debris and the blue wave which is the fastest frequency, breaks up easiest, and so it scatters. It's got a special name, Rawley scattering. So I don't want to destroy the, the magic that's too much physics, but it is quite wonderful that it is light and it is, and it is speed that gives us color. So light travels at 186,000 miles a second, and it breaks up as it hits material that it cannot go through. Now, blue breaks up very easily. It's the fastest frequency. And so you see blue. Now, um, that was just a little bit of background that it is quite an amazing gift of God that we have light. And it is light that gives us color. It takes me back to Bernard of Clairvaux and the invention of Gothic architecture. In God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. And that was the whole thought process behind the development of the great Gothic cathedrals that allow the sky and the light to come in. So we're going to allow the light in, and we're going to look at blue, which is the fastest frequency. And um, while well, you're looking at a head, beautiful head by Perugino, thank you, um, a head by Perugino, that, um, who was the teacher of, of Raphael. So let's just go on and see. Blue, obviously, is the color of heaven. And this is a marvelous French window with the star of Bethlehem. It's only because the sky goes dark that we're able to see the stars at night. And this very deep blue, the color of the cosmos and the color of heaven, used by the ancient glassmakers from ground up lapis lazuli and cobalt. As we need to start first in these early days of the Christian story, the Christian art, we find that ultramarine came from those Latin words ultramarinus, meaning beyond the sea, because 
The lapis lazuli stones came from so far away that nobody could even imagine how far away it was. And because you had, because you had in those ancient days illiteracy, people couldn't read, no one could read. It wasn't such a bad thing. Charlemagne himself couldn't read. You had to tell the story with everything you had at your disposal, flowers, images, everything, including color. So in the mystical tradition of Christian art, the deep ultramarine came to symbolize God's deep and secret wisdom, which of course penetrates the cosmos and this idea of the whole of heaven being full of this wisdom. That's mentioned in the book of Job, but it also, I think Paul mentions it somewhere when he talks the deep and secret wisdom of God hidden for long ages past and now revealed. So when you see blue in Christian art, you would be taken to that place of thoughtfulness. So this is a wonderful early Netherlandish nativity. And it shows the Virgin resting in the wisdom of God, swathed in the ultramarine, while the baby is laid in the manger, watched over by the ox and the ass. I have a whole story about the ox and the ass, because they're always ignored, but they're very important. And that would have been from a triptych that people would have carried with them, perhaps a traveling triptych. Now, the, the great ultramarine came from the stone lapis lazuli, which only came from one place in the world in those days, and that came from the very high and remote peaks of Afghanistan. When you look at this amazing photograph and you break your heart over the fact that there's a tank there, what could a tank ever do to dominate those mountains? So way up in these high peaks, um, lapis lazuli had been mined for over 6,500 years and transported right through those mountains and right down to Egypt and other places on the Mediterranean. And the mountains are simply incredible. There's nothing that I've ever seen in my life to equal them. And when you say that the blue symbolized heaven, well, it came from heaven as well. In the, in the ancient tradition in India, if you ascended to heaven, it meant that you went up the Himalayas. Ascending to heaven meant stopping your life and going up the mountain to live a spiritual life. You can see in this map of Afghanistan the panhandle there, which is obviously linked, left in order to link China to the Middle East, and of course to make a path for the Silk Route, which you've all heard about over this um, summer school. So that was what the Silk Route looks like. It, it incre incredibly precipitous. You would have had camel trains, caravans, working their way slowly, plod, plod, plod always at risk from bandits or falling off the mountain, and embedded in those caravans, tiny nuggets of this incredibly precious stone, lapis lazuli. You can see how it had to wind slowly up the very, very steep, excuse me, the very, very steep slopes of these mountains. Of course, every time this stone passed, changed hands, it became more expensive. People took a cut. And by the time lapis lazuli arrived in Italy, it was much more expensive than solid gold. Gold you could get. You only had to have a little whisper to some prince archbishop or some young blood in the Florentine aristocracy to mention perhaps that you'd heard that there'd been a bit of a uh, you know, a misbehavior somewhere, and, but you did think that um, one of the churches needed a new altarpiece and you could probably work it so that it would, all things would be forgiven. All you had to do was give some gold florins. You couldn't do that with the lapis lazuli. So here it is. On the left, you see the rough cut stone, and here a polished stone showing that it was full of specks of gold. It was truly a magical stone, and in ancient Egypt, it was considered a, a wonderful and mysterious stone which represented the truth and was directly linked to the gods. Well, if you think that in the Christian tradition it comes to mean wisdom, perhaps wisdom and the truth are in fact the same thing. According to some of the 
legends. Cleopatra used it on her eyes uh, to make herself beautiful. And then you see a lovely sacred ibis made of lapis lazuli right here. There was also a medical treatise showing that lapis lazuli was ground down into a paste and used to help people with sight problems. Most of the things the Egyptians did were actually based in really good facts and probably worked. Maybe that should be looked at again. So, and because it was a symbol, you know, it was symbolic of the truth, it was close to the gods, it was very special and rare, it was also used for wrapping mummies. So, when we look at the stones, we can see two kinds of blue, the lapis lazuli in its rough cut, and down here, azurite. So azurite was a cheaper form of stone, which gave a more gray blue. I'm going to probably show you some later on. And then malachite for green and cinnabar for red. Well, by the time we get to Florence, we've got this incredibly precious stone, which has to be ground with great difficulty to a powder and mixed with eggs. Um, the sticky bonding would have been eggs for egg tempera. And because eggs were then mixed with water, and the water dried, you got a very intense blue, which you never got with oil painting. May I just say, I make my own paint for the very reason that I want the clearest possible color. And any other bonding agent, such as any kind of oil, or certainly acrylic, which is the invention of the devil, of course, um, dry, water dries out completely, leaving you with the pigment. And as you know, liquid slows down light waves. When you look at your feet in water, they bend. So all light waves slow down as they go through any liquid. Can't even oil, it's gunky. And so to get the pure color, I use water-based secret um, recipe to arrive at very pure color. So here is the Virgin, again wearing the blue to denote the wisdom of God. And she has a book on her knee not that she would ever have been able to read if she was a teenager in Nazareth. And the lovely blue also up in the canopy above her head. So this would have been an expensive painting. Indeed it was, it was made for the convent of San Marco in Florence. Um, you see the blue's also been used quite extensively for the predella underneath here, showing the life of the Virgin. But what um, what Frangelico, who, by the way, is an incredibly wonderful and mysterious painter, the only painter I've ever met who actually painted a black halo, mm -hmm. yes, on Judas at the time of the betrayal, the kiss, it's a black halo. Oh, Frangelico was a very interesting man. So this is from his convent where he lived. And you see he's allowed space to link the Annunciation with the expulsion because when the whole of the New Testament is linked to the Old Testament um, very closely, and you see the expulsion here of Adam and Eve, the angel of the Lord, and as Eve was expelled, she wept tears of sorrow, and where her tears fell on the ground, white lilies grew up, and the white lily came to, came to symbolize the Virgin Mary. So it's a beautiful piece of poetic um, symmetry there that uh, the, that Eve, Eve's repentance, is echoed in the obedience of Eve, of Mary, and that's why she's called the second Eve. Gabriel has an aura of light all around him as he comes in to give the, new, give the message. And you see, the blue of the, is so intense, it's casting a blue shadow. Um, an amazing and beautiful painting by Frangelico using pure lapis lazuli, which is as beautiful today as it was over 500 years ago. Moving on a little bit, we see the lapis lazuli still used by the consummate artist of the international Gothic style, Botticelli. Botticelli painting this painting, which is in Edinburgh. It's a large painting, and it quite simply, it makes you go weak at the knees, because you can, you can feel so much emotion in the stillness of it. And you see the baby who is sleeping, or maybe not, or maybe worse. And then your eye drifts up to the pile of stones, and you see that they form a cross, and subtly are hinting at what will come. 
And you look down at the baby and you see him surrounded by pink roses, which you know are the symbol of the Virgin Mary. Um, her, she is known as the Mystic Rose. All the great rose windows of the Gothic cathedrals all over Northern Europe are named rose windows because of her. And the rose, the opening of the petals of the rose symbolize the opening of the soul to God. Mary is the mystic rose. The cathedrals are dedicated to her. It is her rose in the rose windows. This is an extraordinary and beautiful painting by Botticelli. Um, Perugino is the teacher of Raphael. And you see so much of the grace of Raphael in Perugino's works. I put in this painting because to show you how they cut corners uh, for financial reasons, the underpainting is azurite on this painting, the underpainting, and then a very th thin layer of ultramarine on the top, and possibly not on the top of the robe of this angel. Can you see the difference, anybody? Yeah? So azurite is a smoky, a smoky blue, and it hasn't got the clarity of the lapis lazuli. The child there, the baby, is pointing to his mouth. This is something you see in Netherlandish works. You see it in Dutch works. Um, and you see why he points to his mouth is because he is the logos, the word. So quite interestingly enough, you will also see Horus pointing to his mouth in ancient Egypt. Now, I'm just throwing that in as something for you to think about. I mean, to me, this is the absolute grace of the Renaissance before anxiety comes in, breaks through with the Baroque, before darkness breaks through with the Baroque, before the Reformation, the Counter-Reformation, and the huge shock waves to the zeitgeist that those events happened. Look at the simplicity and the peace of that painting. And again, in her veil, you will see the Azurite with a bit of, of, of lamp black added. So going on to the next century, we are still using lapis lazuli in this wonderful painting by Sasa Ferrata. And I thought it would give me a chance. Trust me, I've had a nightmare trying to decide what not to put in, what to leave out. Um, every painting in the talk is there for a very good reason. This one, because first of all, the colors as I try to explain, people cannot read. And so they have to get signals through what they see and what they hear. I'm not, at my old age now, totally convinced that literacy is such a great thing. <laughs> Does not literacy limit imagination? Does it not disempower memory? How is it that Homer's Iliad was remembered verbatim for 300 years? Because people could remember things. But when we look at this Madonna, you will probably see as a fairly generic Madonna, but let's look at the colors. You've got the white, the red, and the blue. So the blue, I've already told you, um, came to represent God's wisdom. And the red, as I shall be telling you tomorrow, is, uh, flows from the throne of God and represents God, God's love. The white it often represents the presence of the Holy Spirit and faith. So faith, love, wisdom. And the Virgin is very still. Paintings that are still are very appealing, particularly in today's world when nothing is still. When you look at the painting like that, you may understand the difference between a painting and an icon. A painting tells you a story. A painting has a narrative. And so much from the Renaissance forward, they had narratives. But before that, you had the Sienese paintings. You had the, the great icons of Cimabue, right? And the icon there, the stasis, that doesn't tell you what to do. It, tell, it tells you how to be. An icon that was used for worship meditation tells you how to be. And when it is an icon of the Virgin, you see a column of prayer. You don't see action. So now. Um, there's getting closer, you will see that no black is included in the shadows. Do you see that? So the colors are simply deepened to give you the shadows. 
We haven't got to the crude process of simply adding black to everything. Um, when we look at this, is, this is actually part of a triptych in London. Uh, uh, a uh, sorry, yes, a triptych. It's the earliest Netherlandish altarpiece extant, uh, now known to be by Robert Campton, and it's called the Zeilen altarpiece. It was bought by Count Anton Zeilen, who's a wonderful Austrian man. When we look at the back of this triptych, we can see the background carved in gesso with patterns of vine, tendrils, and grapes. The whole of the background is carved with, and then gilded. I mean, a very painstaking process. And that was to, first of all, signal the, the, the Eucharist, the wine of the Eucharist, but also the trailing vine in the earliest church alluded to the, um, the, the caring church, the all-caring Christian church, tentacles. So this is the blue angel, and the blue angel is a cherubim. And you have, in the Catholic tradition, nine choirs. I can't tell you them all. Every time I try to do my lecture on angels, something goes horribly wrong with the IT. Lights fail, mic fails, everything fails. So I've given up. I said, fine, I won't do angels, if that'll make you happy. <laughs> it is really terrible that every time I try to talk about angels, um, something happens. Well, so this, let's try and get to the end of this talk before something goes wrong. Um, the cherubim are blue. They're the second choir. And they, again, the blue represents the wisdom. And in this particular altarpiece, and I'm not sure if I've got the whole one here. I might just go forward now. Um, the other colors are all there, and the other angels represent the other, um, the other aspects of the faith in the white, the red, the blue, and the, and the purple, which is a color of mourning. So you can see it's Netherlandish because there are no halos, as you see. And you can see the angel weeping and holding up the, one of the symbols of the passion, the, the sponge there. And this is John, always shown very young and wearing red. As we move on to secular art, we find blue very prominently used. And by the time we get to Vermeer, those amazing paintings that are so beautifully flooded with light, we see an entirely different blue or different mixes of blue. In this case, he is using a white underneath lead white with a thin layer of ultramarine as a glaze on top, the white shining through. And it makes a wonderful contrast with the dull golds of the dress and the ochres and the yellows. I mean, this is the classic Vermeer. And I know you all know these paintings very, very well. Now we go to another blue, which is indigo. So you have to remember all these blues, right? Indigo is entirely a different thing. It is very easy to get uh, to find. It is copiously produced, and it comes from the desert, not the snowy mountains, and it comes from Africa. And indigo has been traded back and forth across Africa for centuries, probably for millennia, on what was the indigo opium route that went from Zanzibar, Zanzibar up to Egypt and back again, indigo opium route. And um, so camels and desert and this intense blue, which is quite, quite different, apparently mentioned as early as the 13th century. So it's a plant, not a stone, grows about six foot high, and it has beans. And it was the wonderful character Marco Polo who first commented on this, on his travels, and mentioned that it had come from India originally. So indigo originally coming from India. Now, in Africa, you have the blue men, the Tureg people, the nomads of the central Sahara. And there is a nobody sees hands and arms are all blue. Every, I'm quite amazed the camel is white, actually. I was thinking, why is the camel not smudged? I'm very worried about the fact that the rope does not go around his face. And I have a horrible sense that there might be a metal hook. Oh, I don't want to think about it a hook in his mouth. I don't want to think that. Let's not think that. So this is one of the blue men of the Sahara, of course, very photogenic. And we're going to see how they made the indigo. In the markets of Africa, you have the most wonderful cloth, all dyed with sort of tie-dye in different patterns, and all dyed with indigo blue. 
uh, which was brought to the West when Vasco da Gama found the trade route to the Spice Islands. So that gives you your historical link. I'm always very keen on history. In fact, I always teach my fine art in terms of context, historical context, and social context. So there is the blue, and I've got some examples. To extract the dye, they had to pound the leaves in a solution of lye. And here you have them pounding out the dye. Not the greatest job to have. Um, some patterns from different parts of Africa. This is from the Congo, showing beautiful patterning, different densities of patterning, and always with this black-blue dye. And then this one is from the Yoruba, from Nigeria, or the Yor Yoruba, I think they say, Yoruba, Nigeria. Again, beautiful, much more complex sort of patterning here. And a lovely, simple one from Mali. Um, the indigo is going to have a story in the West, which becomes quite big. That is the story of the blue jeans. Now, I'm sure everybody in this room either has them or had them at some point in their life. And it was all thanks to this person here, Levi Strauss. And I'm not making this up. He bought this very heavy canvas, took it over to California to make tents for the gold mining community to shade them from the sun, the Californian sun. But people didn't seem to want to spend money on tents. But what they wanted was a tough pair of trousers with plenty of pockets. And he made the first pair, and it was a complete success. And so he, he, he patented these blue trousers, which are called, of course, blue jeans, Levi's. And they've gone on. Now, they were particularly popular in the 50s and 60s in the 20th century for political reasons that the Levi trouser showed solidarity with the workers. We were in the grip of a great socialist and communist push. And uh, everybody was wearing blue jeans to show that at heart they're really workers. It's quite untrue, most people weren't. However, now the blue jean has taken on another role, which is also political and social role. And that is what I say, virtu it's called virtue signaling. Um, the, the virtue signaling is that you will spend a fortune on your jeans, provided they're ripped and look like a pauper. And you have to say that you have been so browbeaten by the thousand and one charities on every street corner, particularly in England, that you are now showing solidarity with the world's poor by showing that you haven't got a bean and you're living in tatters. But you could spend a fortune on your Manola Blahnik flats, if you want to, or your Gucci bag, or even your diamonds or your mink, but definitely not on your jean. Um, now, blue also appears as this indigo in the mushroom, and I personally would not be up for trying these mushrooms, but they are actually edible. Now we come to another blue, Prussian blue. We've now got a blue that is artificial. It is a, it is a chemical compound. For any chemist, you might be able to see that. And it's made from cyanide salts. Prussic acid is this Prussian blue that I worked hard to get. It's better on my screen than there, but it is a bit lighter than what you can see there on the screen. And it's made from cyanide salts. And it was artificial, so there was no limit to how, you know, you could make tons of it. And it was made in Prussia, and it became immensely popular in the Prussian court. Now, the first painting, sorry, the first painting, one of the earliest paintings, use it was this one. And you can see that it's a little bit degrading here or getting mixed with black. But there you can see in the robe of the Virgin in this entombment in 1710, so early 18th century, the new Prussian blue being used, coming into action. Uh, Antoine Watteau in France, the great Rococo painter, uses Prussian blue a lot, which strikes me as rather rather sinister, because his paintings portray a world, an idyllic, ephemeral, effervescent world that is very soon going to be blown right out of the sky by the French Revolution. And the fact that the paints were toxic somehow adds to that sense, for me at any rate. Um, Anthony van Dyck is quite simply one of the most undersung painters 
that it, I think Anthony van Dyck is one of the greatest of all painters. When do you ever see an, a Van Dyck exhibition, a Van Dyck lecture, Van Dyck anything? The most wonderful painter, the humanity, the depth of his figures, the eyes, the, 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 the maturity, let's use the maturity. And in this pic picture here, he shows Christ carrying his cross with the, uh, this Prussian blue made from prussic acid here. And you see that if you look carefully and you're wide awake, that you have the stigmata, right? And the wound, but you do not have the crown of thorns or the blood, and he's carrying his cross. So you know that this is a meditative image, it's a meditation on the, it, it, is, it is obviously not pre the crucifixion because he wouldn't have the wounds. Do you understand? You have to learn to, paintings are like mysteries to be unraveled, and I am incredibly excited when I find now, after so many years, I find new things to get to, that, I, that I uncover. Well, in the great courts of the patricians, Prussian blue is de rigueur if you're having your portrait painted, and this was Mrs. Siddons, Sarah Siddons, a famous actress. It's in the National Gallery. And she has the Prussian blue fichu around her shoulders. She is said to have fainted at the sight of the Ilgin marbles. Well, I mean, who wouldn't at the sight of Dionysus lying there with his legs? Well, who wouldn't, I mean? Wow. So anyway, that's the story. So um, the blue is really definitely Gainsborough's signature color. Here is the blue boy in the Huntingdon Library in Los Angeles. But I think one of the most touching for me appearances of Prussian blue, which was very, very important in the Prussian court, the Prussian army wore it, uh, the, the, the northern Germans, they all wore Prussian blue, they all had Prussian blue. But here we are, at least in England, it's the Prussian blue here in the uniform of Horatio Lord Nelson, Vice Admiral of the Fleet. This is a wonderful, wonderful portrait by John Francis Rigaud. And Nelson had not lost either an eye or an arm at this stage. And I think the composure of the painting, the composition, helped by the, if I may just be a bit, helped by the horizontal line of the hat, which reinforces and underscores the, the stillness of the eyes, the gaze coming straight out of you. And then the arm leading the, and, and the sword. Well, that was the portrait. And go a bit closer, you see that as an absolutely wonderful early portrait of Horatio Nelson. Um, he's in his dress uniform, by the way, for where is our oh, Admiral? There he is. So he's in his dress uniform. On, at the Battle of Trafalgar, his officers begged him not to go up on deck with his, with his medals and his uniform. Begged him not to, because he had you know, all these stars and things, and that he would be a complete target. And he did something which, in my mind, was very Greek, for any of you at the Greek talks. He did something which was ra just rose above all that, rose above this trivial moment of possible death. And he said, in honor I gained them, and in honor I will die with them, if need be. And of course, he received a musket shot, and the Times reported it, that the musket went through the star to penetrate his heart. Actually, that's not true, because the actual, I've seen the actual jacket, and it came in at the shoulder there. So a very sad story about Nelson's death. Um, we go back to France. And we see the great works of Ingres, again, this wonderful Prussian blue appearing everywhere. Ingres sadly was never paid for the painting because the empire collapsed. The whole, the whole, as, soon as, as soon as Napoleon was defeated in 1815, the Battle of Waterloo, um, the, the empire, the whole system collapsed and he was never painted and he uh, never paid. He ended up in Rome without any patrons, which is not a very good thing. So this is a very good example of the blue in different tones, shininess, and all kinds of different tones of brush and blue. Now I'm afraid, I think I'm going to have to, can you all shut your eyes totally for one minute? Totally shut, right? Nobody look at the screen just for a second. Okay, wait a minute, keep, right. You can look at the screen, it's fine. Haven't got there yet. Um, we go on to another ang. Uh, again, in the French court, this is the Contest d'Orsonville, 
and this is in the Frick, and this is an ancestor of a very good friend of mine, and it does go so terribly well with this lovely ochre yellow. And then even in Japan, the color arrives eventually, and it's used in the early 19th century by Hokusai for the great wave. If you ever wondered what that paint, what that color was, it is Prussian blue. Um, one of my students put this in one of her works recently and said she liked it because it made her feel so peaceful and calm. <laughs> what? <laughs> You're just about to get drowned by a tsunami. Um, cobalt is our fourth color. Cobalt is another one of the most beautiful, intense blues, and it's a chemical compound and extremely stable. So it was used historically for the great blue and white ceramics made in China, the Chinese porcelain. And this is, um, shows how it's blue. It's called underglaze blue. And in, if anybody is here who collects porcelain, I'd love to have a chat, because I do, and so does Carol, wherever she is. And we, uh, our family, have collected porcelain for three generations. So the blue is a very beautiful, clear, underglaze blue. And this is one of my own pieces. Um, Oscar Wilde, who loved Chinese porcelain at least as much as I do, famously said, how can I live up to my blue and white? <laughs> well, you can't, can you? I mean, you couldn't, could you? R I know, just one of those things. I think his most famous witticism, you know, he made so many wonderful jokes. His best one was, be yourself, everyone else is taken. I like that. Really. <laughs> I like that. So this is a wine jug, which is uh, my, my wine jug, and there you see the blue. It's a transitional period, with lovely swishes of blue across the jar. And it's used in Chinese imari, where it's combined with this iron red, and the blue is the underglaze blue, and the red is painted on in these very fine lines, so you get different textures. That's an absolutely darling teapot that I have at home. From the first half, of the 18th century, so 17, well, probably, I don't know, 1730, something like that. The Clark plates were made for export, and they went to Holland in ships called the Clarks. That's why they're called Clark. And this is a really lovely one from 1722. So you can see that the early 18th century, whether it's in painting or in ceramics, was using these blues very, very prol prolifically. Um, the powder blue was dangerous because it's very toxic, and you had to blow the powder blue onto the, onto, the, onto the vase through a straw and not inhale it. And then the gold that was ready there would shine through when it was fired. And they're very special. This is my one, and I think it's better than the one in Vienna. So um, <laughs> it was made really for the Ming emperors. So um, you can actually date your Chinese porcelain by concentrations of cobalt. The little black spots here, uh, can you see the black sort of very dark spots where it's concentrated, little clumps of powder? Help me to, I date this to 1499. Um, so this, and it's got no shine on it because it lay in the sea for 500 years. Um, a painting by an Uzbek painter that I found, I would love to have bought it, but I couldn't get in touch with him, um, just shows Chinese bowls with water in the top bowl and the moss making their way to the water, and it's very still, and the still life should be still. I think it's absolutely beautiful. So we have the Chinese porcelain appearing in art in the form of the Dutch still lifes, you see here, um, making a wonderful contrast to pomegranates and to lemons and to lots of other fruit that they had. And finally, in the Dutch world, into the paintings. So these paintings were made uh, throughout the year because you had to wait for things to flower before you could paint them. It was cheaper to buy a painting than to have flowers that you were buying flowers. Flowers were very, very expensive. And the beautiful randomness of the compositions, the wonderful collection of paintings, the, the abundance of it all. Jan van Heysen was the greatest of the vase painters. And this one you can see in the Wallace collection. And you'll see how they fall down and their broken stems, look here. Um, that's an extraordinarily profligate image because tulips were in phenomenally expensive. One tulip bulb could cost you an annual salary. 
if you had no dowry for your daughter, you could offer one tulip bulb. Um, when the tulip mania broke because the weather changed and the bulbs rotted in the water, I mean in the earth, of course there was a massive crash. Um, going closer again, the wonderful blue that you see on the bluebells on the hyacinths here, and these, these very, very beautiful flowers scattered among all the other colors. Coming to Van Gogh, we're now in, we're now in 1890, early 1890, February 1890, the irises. The composition is very irregular because he's influenced by Japanese woodblocks. And he said the painting was like the lightning conductor for my illness. In other words, it discharged his illness. Um, this painting at the time that it was sold to Alan Bond was the most expensive painting ever, ever sold at, a, at, a, at, a, at a, a pitiful $54 million, which is nothing compared to what paintings are sold for now. Um, Van Gogh's, not Van Gogh, sorry, Cezanne's card players sold, I think, to Qatar or somewhere for something like $254 million. Um, never seen, of course, locked away. Alan Bond couldn't pay for it, so eventually it was bought by an American mu museum. Starry Night is interesting. It's not entirely due to his so-called illness. I'm not actually sure how ill he was. Um, he painted this out of the east-facing window of his room in the... Uh, we ought to go there, actually, Rosie, to see... Yeah, in saint Remy de provence I'd love to go and see it. I've never been there. So he painted out of the window of this incredible swirly sky. Um, and the swirls, we allude to the fact that he might have had poisoning from absinthe, which causes yellow swirls. Um, yellow swirls also get caused by digitalis, which was the drug of choice for anybody with epilepsy. And they thought that he had a frontal lobe epilepsy. But they were actually whirlpool galaxies. And this was drawn in 1845, long before. It's possible that being quite an intellectual person, Van Gogh knew about the whirlpool galaxies and was painting them in. And we all arrogantly assumed that he was just ill. Um, there is the galaxy, you see, a beautifully swirling galaxy. The other one, there he is, and he's now painting, using Prussian blue again, um, and uh, he's painting this very horrible color for the foxglove, which was so poisonous, in a portrait of uh, this person, Dr. Paul Gachet, who was a homeopathic doctor and an artist. He was also a very good friend. And it's so sad that when Vincent came back from, 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 um, from San Remy, when he discharged himself in May, it was May 1890, he went, it was 16 hours on the train. He went back to Paris, and none of his family, which were extensive, bothered to come down and take him back. And he'd been incarcerated for a year. Well, if you've even been in hospital for a week, you feel a bit wobbly when you come out. He got back to Paris without any problems, and he never, ever had any more attacks. But when he arrived in Paris, unfortunately, the news of his incarceration had run ahead of him, and the stigma of mental illness was profound. So his friends got together and said, I think we should find a solution. Um, what about Paul? Paul's got a nice garden out at Auvergne. Let's see if Paul will look after him. Be better for him too, wouldn't it? Meanwhile, of course, he'd sent all his artworks up to be looked after by his brother Theo. And Theo had not exhibited them, but stuffed them on the top of cupboards and under cupboards and under beds in his house and stuffed them into a room in a cellar in the house of a friend, Pierre Tangay. So when the friends heard Vincent was back, they managed to get the, tea, the key, they extracted the key, they went into the cellar and they said, my God, he's a genius. And on the, the Figaro the next morning, Vincent van Gogh, madman genius, poor old Theo. I mean, he was so shocked. So anyway, here we have him with this you know, characteristic brushwork painting this dark bloom. And that is the man who diagnosed him. So in thanks, he painted this portrait, which the parents thought was ghastly, and they used it to cover a chicken coop. <laughs> now we come to Pablo Picasso. Pablo's deep, which you all know this, I mean, uh, maybe it's time to do another couple of talks on the young Picasso. I haven't done, 
I don't think I've ever, actually ever done the young Picasso. Picasso is in Paris. He's alone. He's cold. It's the winter of 1901. He's so wounded that, I mean, there's no body language, no, even no sleeves to the coat. He's no body language at all. The face is like a white mask on a stick that he's holding up and staring through. And this terrible dark blue, he has been wounded by the death of Carlos Casagamas, who committed suicide on February the 16th of that year. The, um, the depression lasted for about three years. And the thing is that Picasso's blue paintings made it worse, because nobody would buy them. So he got poorer and poorer and more and more depressed. This is one of his friends with a large glass of absinthe, which was illegal in England, by the way, but was very, very prevalent in Paris and caused a lot of mental illness. Um, as we go on, the, the blue paintings, which are now very popular and much admired, he continued to paint these. He was also deeply under the influence of El Greco, so that accounts for the elongated fingers and hands. Um, when we go back to Germany and Prussia, we find these heavy blues and blacks used by the German expressionists. And the very spiky, harsh shapes, usually coupled with cr very um, acidic yellow. I'm sure you've seen that in the work of um, Kirchner and schmidt rottluff and Heckel and the other members of the German expressionist group. The acid yellow is a very strong color. It's, um, it's like a greeny yellow. Okay, I do want to say something about it, a slight detour here. That color is also used by Picasso in his Weeping Woman. Uh, you see it in late Botticelli as well. And it's a color, if you believe that colors mean things, it's a color of chronic anxiety. And you see it in the work of the Expressionists in contrast to the tremendous Prussian blue um, as well. So the acid yellow. Now, during 1937, about 20,000 paintings were rounded up as degenerate. That's a lot of paintings. There's a lot of hard work to round them up, including um, Chagall's works. And this was Goebbels' attempt to clean up German culture. And uh, he said that it was assault and assault on Western civilization. But it was nothing like. I'm sorry about this. It was nothing like the assault on Western civilization that was about to break out in the very next year. And I'm sorry to say, the blue plays a profound part in this, and you don't need to look. The fact is that there was a, a chemical compound used as a fertilizer in America in the 1880s, 1888. And it was toxic because it included Prussian salts. And that color, came in to Zyklon B, which was the gas used in Auschwitz and the gas chambers, and it left traces. Now, this is an archive photo that I managed to find before it was all cleaned up and sanitized and disinfected and history was rewritten. Before that, I found this. So the first gassing of human beings by, by Germans were began in September, apparently, not my, stati not my figures, their figures, in 1941. And this one was built between August and October 1942. And the Zyklon B contained hydrogen cyanide with prussic acid. And so the building is saturated with blue, particularly in that corner. Maybe they were trying to get out the door. So it's very tragic to see that. Um, sorry about that, but you know, I believe in being completely honest about everything. So after the war, wonderful. Chagall, just a Matisse, I mean, is filled with joy, wonderful, ecstatic images of the famous blue nude. Now, for Matisse, it wasn't joy. He was already in a wheelchair, and he was going to die the next year. And for, I don't think any artist, any old, old artist, because the human soul does tend to shrink a bit, maybe, when you get a bit older. He is about to die, and yet he produces images of immense joy and, and wonderful, positive, joyful images. And this is his, his blue nude. Uh, the work of the great chapel that he made required four years of tremendous untiring effort, and he said it was the best work, the, the, the masterpiece of his life. 
And you see that he uses blue and yellow there. And if I can go back to the mystical tradition, the blue in the Christian tradition was the color of secret wisdom, and the yellow, the, come, the color of illumination and inspiration and revelation. So yellow, the color of revelation and illumination coming through the wisdom. Doesn't that make perfect sense? All the previous um, plans that he had included oranges and reds, but he left them out. So I so often finish my talks with Chagall. Here he is on the fr fragility of human love, the boy offering you flowers, and the little white dove, which you probably read as peace, um, and the little sliver of a moon over a city, which is usually Vitebsk. This is probably the Vitpa River here. It could be a memory of Vitebsk, his homeland, and it's a child with a dove. Now, I've got a few minutes, luckily, and I'm able to go on into the 20th century. Chagall's Blue Village, where again you have the Virgin infused with love, holding the baby, and the figure of the father who always takes on uh, slightly the image of the, of the exile. Uh, uh, well, I've got, I've got um, various lectures on, on Chagall, but he's always the exile. He's never quite at home. But in the background, you see Vitebsk, and the people are coming back. It's over. At the end of the war, from a population of 250,000, there were only 118 people alive in Vitebsk. As it was a wooden city, it was burnt to the ground. But in his mind, it isn't burnt. And there you see his cottage with the three steps and the figure of maybe his mother standing in the doorway. Of course, he's most famous for his wonderful stained glass, where the blue really comes into its own. And these are in the Art Institute of Chicago. Wonderful as the blue light comes through onto the floor. Marvelous images. Chagall managed to be a peaceful, peace-loving, conciliatory person who was working on reconciliation when he died. These are some windows from the little chapel, Tudley in Kent, which I think he did for free. Um, to, in the memory of Sarah, Goldschmidt, who was drowned at the age of 21. Her father was a great financier, and she was British. She'd been to the Hadassah Medical School in, 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 um, in, in, here in, in Jerusalem. It is Jerusalem, isn't it? Yeah, thanks. And, and seen the wonderful windows. And so when she was drowned, they, uh, they wrote to him, we don't know what to do, but could you do this? And he did. So this is the only church in the world that has all the windows by Chagall. And there she is floating in the water with light on her face, very, very peaceful, as portrayed by Chagall. Um, Chagall said, my homeland lies only in my soul. He is the ultimate exile. But somehow the blue, the healing color, stays with him. And as he was near his death, he worked on these windows for St. Stephen's Church in Mainz, which were a gesture of, wait for it, German-Jewish reconciliation. And in this particular window, you go back to the beginning of the story in Genesis, the creation of man as an inert, unconscious being in the arms of a great angel. And you see in the rainbow, which is the covenant of God with man, you see those colors, white, red, and green. We haven't got to green. The white for faith, the red for love, and the green for hope. In Latin, it is fide, caritas, spes. And you see those on the steps that lead to the Virgin's throne. You will always see red, green, and white together. And the cockerel, of course, a great symbol for Chagall. So Rothko, after the war, people were emotioned out. They didn't want narratives. They didn't want to be told what to do. And these great big fields of color were very healing in their own right. The blue ones particularly he absolutely adamantly said that he was not an abstract painter. People, he said it was about emotion, and that people broke down and wept in front of his painting. In some sense, uh, it gives me the sense of man in the face of the vast, immense nothingness, the vastness, the emptiness. And it takes me back to the early sublime period of art, which was just after the beginning of the 19th century. The sublime, where man is at the mercy of the elements somehow here lost in this great vastness. And then we go from this 
spiritual heavyweight, that's what Wendy Beckett quite correctly called Mark Rothko, who incidentally came to America at 13. He was a Russian emigre, emigre Jewish. Um, he died in 1969, he killed himself. Um, we go to a person who very, knew, very much knew how to work 